submit all our degrees under your authority. Every academic qualification right now, we bring it to the altar. And we say we don't know nothing. And I pray in Jesus' name that you, omniscient God, may speak to us. Because your wisdom is eternal. Your wisdom is priceless. And I pray in Jesus' name that you may shorten every believer so that we are strong against the schemes of the enemy. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Let us say a loud amen. together for the worship team, amen. Hallelujah. I want us to look at the reasons why we should study end time prophecy. Today, the approach is going to be more of a teaching format because I want you to understand that in the last days, according to the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, there will be scoffers and mockers. Who will come to you and say, where is the promised coming of the Lord? Since our fathers have been laid to rest, we've been told that Jesus is coming back. Where is he? And then I do believe that you cannot answer them emotionally, but you need to answer them from an informed point of view. Praise the name of Jesus. So I want us therefore to dissect your own to be rightly dividing the word of truth within this short space of time so that you have answers. Let me just tell you that in my journey of faith, I've always been convicted that Jesus Christ is the soon coming king. But there were moments when I was shaken. There were two movements that shook me. One movement was the kingdom dominion theology movement. Because these people believe, these are believers, they love Jesus and they are born again, spirit filled. And they believe that the church must take over the world first before Jesus comes. So in other words, they believe that there must be a Christian prime minister or a priest, a Christian president all over the world before Jesus comes. So in, 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 such, in such a way that in some countries, kingdom dominion believers are regarded as terrorists. Because they even collect weapons and then and, and they believe that they must literally take over governments. So it's a very extremist a, 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 an organization within the body of Christ. Now here's the thing, I do believe that uh, we need to rightly divide the word of truth in this subject so that we are able to answer all the questions that will be thrown at us. First reason why you should study end time prophecy. In the book of Revelation chapter 3, chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible tells us that blessed are those who read aloud and hear and take to heart the words of this prophecy. <clears throat> now, the book of Revelation is the only book in the Bible with a promise. If you read the words that are contained within this book, you are blessed. Notice that the word of God says, read aloud. I want to just talk about that word aloud. Aloud simply means when we read about end times, when we read about eschatology, we must not do so apologetically. We must not do so secretively because this is the story about the coming of the Lord. This is the story of the bridegroom who's coming for his bride. So when, when, when the bride reads about this story, the bride ought to be excited. I love you hearing me. There is something seriously wrong with the bride who is not looking forward to her wedding. That bride needs counseling. So if the church is secretly cherishing the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are in trouble. We are, as a matter of fact, our love for Jesus might as well be questioned. So that is why the word of God says, blessed is he who reads and love. In other words, we're not just going to be loud on prosperity message only. We're not just going to be loud during motivational talks, but we will be loud even regarding the coming of Yeshua. And that is why, that is why the exclamation that is concluded with, as you read towards the end of the book of Revelation, is Maranatha, which means, Lord, even so come. Lord Jesus, let's say it together, Maranatha. Maranatha. That is a proclamation that is saying, Jesus, come. I want you, Jesus. 
I am excited about your coming. Praise the name of Jesus. There is something, let me reiterate this, there is something wrong with the church that's not looking forward to the Lord's coming. Let no preacher fool you. We must be excited about the Lord's coming. Here's another reason. In the book of Daniel chapter 12 verse 4, Daniel sees visions of end time prophecy. And then in chapter 4, he is told to seal the words of prophecy. In other words, this is not for your generation. Seal them up. This is not going to be explained to you. This is not going to be interpreted for you. But just see that. And when you have seen it, don't even ask questions. Seal it up. Why? Because it's for another generation. Here's another thing in Revelation chapter 10 verse 4. Same thing you said. The Bible says John, the, 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 the apostle, is on the island of Patmos and he sees powerful visions and then he hears seven thunders speaking to him. And the seven thunders spoke. He was about to write down and then the voice of the Lord says, don't write what you hear down. Amen. Why? Because they are not, this is not for your generation. This is for another generation. Here's the thing, here's the thing, beloved. Are you aware that we are the generation that must unseal that which was sealed during the time of Daniel? Yes. In other words, everything that God hid from the prophets of old is now going to be revealed in this generation. Because we are the end time generation. Whatever the seven thunder spoke to John while he was on the island of Patmos, that which was sealed up is now going to be unraveled. Praise the name of Jesus. There is no prophetic mystery that will not be unlocked in this generation. Here's the question. As God is unsealing prophecy, as God is unraveling mysteries, is there somebody ready to listen? Because you see, God is always speaking. God is always wanting to download things into our hearts. But unfortunately, men and women in the house of the Lord are too busy doing something else. I pray that that which Daniel could not be explained to, I want us to understand that may you be the recipient of that. That which John the Apostle could not understand on the island of Patmos, may you understand that. Now, what makes me say you are the generation that will understand these things? In the book of Matthew chapter 24, verses 33 to 34, Jesus says, after prophesying about end times, Jesus gives a long list of things that will happen in the last days. And then he says, the generation that will see the fig tree blossom is the generation that will witness all these things. And then he says this, and this generation will not pass away up until all these things have happened. Yes. Now here's the thing. Are you ready for this? In, on, the, on the 14th of May, 1948, Israel became a nation. Israel became an independent nation. The fig tree that Jesus speaks about in the book of Matthew chapter 24 is figuratively referring to the nation of Israel. Remember that they had been scattered all over the world and then in 1948 after World War II for the very first time they were gathered in their nation and the fig tree started blossoming. In other words, if you're born in 1948 up until now, you are the generation that will see the unfolding of end time prophecy. In other words, what I'm saying to you, you are the generation that will see the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the generation. And I want you to therefore take these things seriously. Be urgent in your approach. It's very important and, and because of time there's a lot we can say there but I want us to move to another reason. Another reason why, beloved, we should study end time prophecy is because in the book of Revelation chapter 22 verse 17 the bride is excited about the coming of the groom and as a result this is not supposed to be a message of gloom and doom. Very important that you understand. Any time prophecy is not supposed to cause trepidation. It is not supposed to cause fear. But the end time prophecy message is supposed to cause encouragement in our hearts. Are you hearing me, brother? We are supposed to encourage one another with end time prophecy. This is what it says. This is what it says in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8. It says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. Are you hearing that? Yeah. You must long, you must
must desire the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of preachers worry that this message will chase people away from church. One of the reasons why a lot of preachers don't preach on end times is because they say you will run away. And I'm looking at the bride of Jesus. I'm looking at the glory that is covering you. I'm looking at the church that is on, sitting on the edge, getting ready for the coming of the Lord. And I don't see people that are running away. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm, I'm seeing the bride of Jesus that is excited and they are shouting, Maranatha, Maranatha, even so, come Lord Jesus, come. Can I say this to you, beloved? If the anti-message is going to cause sh churches to shrink, those people were not seriously getting saved. If, if the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is a message that should be shoved away because it's not good for church growth, it means whoever wants to join the church on the basis that we don't preach end times, that person is not genuinely saved. Because the culmination of our salvation is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to understand three stages of salvation. You get saved when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. But now, I want you to understand that salvation also is a continuous tense. It's a present continuous tense. We've been saved. We are being saved. And guess what? We shall be saved. So the culmination, the climax of your salvation will be at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Why should that message be hidden? And these are things that we should be asking ourselves. So beloved, I want you therefore to be encouraged as you reflect on the Lord's coming. The Bible says the sons of Issachar understood the times. And they knew what the nation of Israel needed to do. My prayer is that we be counted among those people who will understand what time it is. Please understand that there is a prophetic clock that keeps on ticking. And everybody must understand that it is your duty as a child of God to understand what time it is. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to ask yourself this question. If you are not looking forward, let's just assume you love Jesus and you are passionate about him. But you're not looking forward to his coming. Will you be captured at his coming? That's the question I want to ask you. And, and this is a theological debate. How about Christians who are born again, who proclaim to be loving Jesus, but somehow they are not looking forward to his coming? And I want us to deal with that question so that you are correctly positioned. Hallelujah. My prayer is that all of us gathered here, if the rapture was to take place today, my prayer is that this church be empty. Amen. No one should be left wondering what happened. What has just hit us? My prayer is that when the Lord comes right now, may there be a report on CNN yeah. that there was a church in Malta that was empty in a second. Yeah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, the question is this. If you are not looking forward to this glorious day, will you be able to participate in it? And here is the story in the book of Luke chapter 17, verses 32 and 35. Verses 32 through to 35. Jesus says, in answer to that question, he says, remember Lord's wife. Hallelujah. Remember Lord's wife. Now, that's a message right there, because you see, when Lot and his family were being rescued out of Sodom, that was a picture of the rapture. I want you to hear that. When Lot and his family were taken out of Sodom, that is an allegorical picture of the rapture. That is what is going to happen to us. Praise the name of Jesus. But now the instruction is, as you go towards Zohar, don't look back. It is very important that you fix your eyes to where you are going. But here's the thing, here's Lord, his wife and his family, they are running towards Zohar, but all of a sudden, Lord's wife looks back. And here's the story, beloved, she could not make it to Zohar. She could not make it. The reason why she could not make it is because though she was, you see, I don't know if you have noticed that whenever you run like this, you always lose direction. Have you ever noticed that? That's why you 
cannot walk a straight line if your head is facing backwards. So, in other words, Lot's wife lost her bearings. Simply because she was looking the direction that God had instructed her not to look to. Sodom had greater attractions for her than where God was taking them. And this is very important that you appreciate that therefore the love of this world must not be in us. Even if you are blessed, please don't hold on too tightly to material things. Very important. Hold to material things loosely so that when it's time to go, you don't struggle to let go. The reason why a lot of people, including believers, we, we miss the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is because our hearts are too connected to soil compared to the place that God is taking us to. And my prayer is that all of us may have a revelation that there is nothing on this earth that can ever compare to the glories that God has prepared for you. Absolutely nothing. Let me ask you a painful question. You might struggle with this one. If you want not today, 20 million friends, and then uh, the angel of the Lord comes to you and says to you, you know, congratulations on your 20 million rent, uh, but when you won the 20 million rent, heavens were planning for Jesus to come down. But we've been sent by God to consult with you if we should give you two years for you to enjoy your 20 million rent, or should heavens release Jesus? Should Jesus come? Or should we give you two million rents? 20 million rents, two years, enjoy yourself. Now, here's the question, what choice would you make? What choice would you make? heaven to hold on to Jesus <laughs> hold on to Jesus so that I can go preach the gospel in Hawaii so that I can go preach the gospel in New York I want to preach the gospel in Mauritius eh? for two years for two years I just want to be a missionary for Jesus in St. Charles to Melbourne, Australia, preaching the gospel. Here's the thing, beloved. You must be so in love with Jesus that even if you won 20 million rent today, you will say to hell with it. I want to be united to my Savior. It, it is very important that you make those decisions. It is very important. Settle that because Lord's wife did not settle that issue as a result. And I want you to understand, Lord was a wealthy man. Lord was a very wealthy man. He was a multi-millionaire of his time. But when it was time to go, he was willing to go. This reminds me of Abraham. The Bible says also Abraham was a wealthy man. But listen, the Bible says he even decided not to build permanent dwellings or here on earth. He never built a mansion for himself. Why? Because he was looking forward to a city whose architect and builder is God. And I pray that that may define your life. Praise the name of Jesus. So Lord's wife, hold on too tightly. And I pray that none of us will hold on too tightly. You know, here's the thing. Even if you have an ambition that has not yet been fulfilled, I pray that that ambition may not stop you from longing for his appearance. Praise the name of Jesus. Do you know that some of the ambitions are very noble? Someone might be saying, Lord, I just want to do my MBA. I just want to complete my MBA, then you can come. Lord, I just want to be a CEO of that company, then you can come. No, 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 no. That's not how it works in the kingdom. When he comes, when the trumpet shall sound, we drop everything. And we say, Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Here is another thing, Matthew chapter 25 is a story of 10 virgins and in this story we'll find 5 virgins 
that had oil in their lamps and they had extra oil. And then the foolish virgins did not have enough oil. This is a very painful story. Unlike Lord's wife story, Lord's wife had too much connection with Saul. To be frank with you, she was not looking forward to going to Saul. But this story is slightly different in the sense that all 10 of them were looking forward to the bridegroom. I want you to note that. All 10 virgins were looking forward to the coming of the bridegroom. But here's the thing. As much as they were all looking forward to the coming of the bridegroom, but not all of them were looking out for him. Here's the message. Don't just look forward, but be on the lookout as well. It's very important. Because you see, there is because the night can be long. Think about this, that the message of the Lord's coming has been preached for the past 2,000 years. For the past 2,000 years, as a matter of fact, the apostles thought Jesus was going to come during their lifetime. But he has not yet come. But here, 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 here is the thing that I want to encourage you with, beloved. You must be excited. You must be looking forward. But please remain spiritually vigilant. Remain, maintain your spiritual vigilance. Notice that the other wise girls say, we cannot share oil with you. In other words, they are saying, we cannot share spectacles. We cannot share prescription glasses. Because our visual challenges are not the same. You see, I cannot, I cannot lend to you my spiritual vigilance. Every person must develop their own spiritual vigilance. It cannot be shared. That is why within the body of Christ, some are spiritually awake, but some are in slumber. And I want us therefore to understand, oil in this case to be hermeneutically uh, accurate, oil in this case represents spiritual vigilance. As a matter of fact, it is very strategic what happens in this passage, because the bridegroom did not come to where the girls were. But the bridegroom stayed a bit far. So that these ten virgins will navigate their way towards the groom. And it was dark. It was at night. So they needed oil. And that signifies, beloved, as Jesus will be in the sky. Notice he will not touch down, yes? He will not touch down. It will only be those that are looking up. Praise the name of Jesus. That will be caught up with him. If you are not looking up in the spirit, you will not be caught up with him. So that is spiritual vigilance. I don't care, even if it takes another 2,000 years for Jesus to come back, maintain your spiritual vigilance. Praise the name of Jesus. Please don't get exhausted along the way. Maintain your spiritual desire for his coming. Hallelujah. You know, I want you to appreciate this. May the Lord help the church not to be in spiritual slumber. You know, what worries me is that all ten girls fell asleep, including the wise ones. So in the last days there will be spiritual slumber. In the last days the majority of the church will be spiritually asleep. But now I pray that even if you have tendencies of closing off spiritually, Maintain spiritual vigilance. Praise the name of Jesus. Maintain spiritual vigilance. You know? and, and sometimes we may slip in and out of slumber. We may slip in and but I want you to decide in your heart. Say to Jesus, Jesus, I want you. Jesus, I am passionately in love with you. I look forward to your coming. I, I tell you, 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 God is faithful. You will maintain your spiritual vigilance. Praise the name of Jesus. And so looking forward when you are not on the lookout is not good enough. I want to answer another question, beloved, today, which causes a lot of people not to study ancient prophecy. When you read the book of Revelation, you see a lot of things going on there. You see one third of rivers becoming blood. One third of the sea becoming blood. All the waters of the earth becoming blood. And you see five kilogram hailstone falling upon people. The skies are, are rolled up like a scroll. And there is earthquake. 7,000 people die 
in the earthquake. All of a sudden, there are strange animals living on the earth, strange beasts that are devouring people. It, it, it is a, an atrocious picture. It's a nightmare. It's like something out of Hollywood when you read the book of Revelation. As a result, a lot of people are saying, if the loving God created the heavens and the earth, why will he release so much wrath upon the heavens, upon the earth? If he is merciful, if he's gracious, why so much anger? And I want us to look into that subject because many of us, many of us struggle with the book of Revelation because of the wrath that we see there. And you know, I don't know if you have noticed, when people go to the book of Revelation, usually they stop at chapter 3. <laughs> chapter 4 is tolerable. But when you get to chapter 6, chapter 7, you go all the way to chapter 22, it's scary. Some can tolerate chapter 20, 21, and 22. But the chapters in between, no, 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 I, mean, I don't want to dream, I don't want to dream bad at night. Let's, 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 let's not go there. And, and, and again, that's why a lot of pastors are saying, no, 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 we don't touch that because it scares a lot of our congregants. No, I want us to therefore understand the context of God's wrath. Why is God angry? One of the statements from Kanye that I am also weary of. These days, a lot of preachers are making this blanket statement, which I want us to be very cautious of. A lot of preachers are saying, no, God is not mad. God is not angry. That statement is grossly incomplete. And I want you to understand that God does get mad. Yeah. Yeah. God, God, God can get angry. God can unleash his wrath. So I don't want you to have this Father Christmas type of a picture when it comes to God. As a matter of fact, He is merciful, He is loving, He is gracious, but the Bible says He is also a consuming fire. Praise the name of Jesus. He is a God of justice. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne. So you can rest assured that He has no tolerance for evil. Now here's the thing, let us try and look into this question. Why so much anger? Why so much wrath in the book of Revelation that we see? So that you understand the context. I'm here to defend God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. You see, and, 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 and this, you, you might need to reflect deeply on some of these things. The story of God's wrath started long time ago before even humanity was here. And I want us to look at the book of Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The book of Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, so that you understand the context of God's wrath. It says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said let there be light and there was light I want us to rightly divide this passage verse 1 says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth the word create there in verse 1 is the word bara in Hebrew which means to make something out of nothing I want you to catch that but now you cannot reconcile verse 1 and verse 2 in the sense that God creates something out of nothing but all of a sudden in verse 2 there is an earth. All of a sudden there are waters. And then you ask yourself a question, what's going on here Lord? Because you are supposed to be creating the earth but the earth is there but the only difference is that this formless is empty and stuck. And there seems to be some form of devastation that has taken place here. Because, you see, and, and let me encourage you, God, when God creates, He creates no disorder. Yeah. Praise the name of Jesus. He is a meticulous God. He is God of excellence. When He creates, there is no fault in His creation. Yeah. But how come there is formlessness? And how come there is emptiness and darkness all of a sudden? What kind of creation is this? And, and then there is a prophet, prophet Jeremiah. Prophets are very interesting in the sense that they not only just prophesy about what will happen in the future, prophets can actually go back in history to unravel mysteries that took place in history. There are things that happen that we don't understand in this present time. A prophet can actually go back in history and actually unravel what happened. And this is what Jeremiah 4 verses 23 to 27 
26 says. Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 to 26. It says, it says I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty. And the heavens, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking. All the hills were swaying. I looked and there was no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked and the fruitful land was a desert. Its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. Yeah. That answers the question. Oh, Jeremiah goes back into Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. He sees homelessness, he sees emptiness, he sees darkness. And then he answers, how come there is homelessness? How come there is darkness? How come there is emptiness? And yet God, it sounds like he had just created. And then he says, all these things were happening before God's fierce anger. And I want us to get into that. And you need to understand, as we rightly divide the word of truth, the answer again as to what happened is found in the book of uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, where Lucifer says, I will ascend to the heavens. I will throw myself in the heavens. I will make myself like the most high God. And at this time, at this time, Lucifer was in charge of the earth. At this time, Lucifer was the guardian cherub over the Garden of Eden. Now, if you want, we don't have time, but we, we could have gone through the whole book of Ezekiel chapter 28, where in 28 verse 13 it says, you were in Eden, the Garden of God. I want you to note that. Verse 14, you were an anointed cherub, and you were so ordained. And then the Bible says uh, in, in verse 14, you were therefore driven out, expelled out of that garden because of your disobedience. So in other words, there was a garden of Eden before there was a garden of Eden where we find Adam and Eve. I want you to understand that. During that garden, during the time of that garden, Lucifer was the guardian, he was the custodian. He was the guardian cherub. And during the time he was in charge of the planet Earth, he had been given dominion by God to rule and reign over the Earth. But there came a point where he thought to me, to himself, I'm doing an excellent job. I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my, my throne. I will be like the most high God. When he said, I will ascend because he was on earth, he says, I will ascend. Now, it is at that time that God caused devastation upon earth. Some of you might actually wonder, how come your children are asking you difficult questions that you as a believer are struggling to answer? <laughs> when your children do natural science at school, one of the questions they come home with is, Mom, Dad, we are told that some of the fossils that have been excavated are millions and millions of years old, according to carbon dating. And yet, from the time of Adam, Till now, it's only 6,000 years old. You understand what I'm saying? Are you walking with me? Yes. Dad, how come no one ever reported seeing a dinosaur in the Bible? Sure. Can you, have you ever thought about that? Yeah. I think those things are huge. Yes. At least no one must have seen one. <laughs> David must have seen this thing. Abraham must have. Come on. Sure. Somehow these things, none of these things were even taken to the ark. <laughs> I mean, think about that, that how are they going to fit in the ark? These things are huge. And then we begin to realize, how come some of these things, when they are carbon dated, they are millions of years old. And yet they are excavated from our own earth. Sure. Have you ever thought about that? And, and I want to say that again, your children will bombard you with these questions. Please be able to answer them. Here is the thing. During this time, millions and millions of years, long before there was Adam, there was an earth. And Lucifer was the guardian cherub. He watched over that garden. As Babu Kanina put it so nicely yesterday, there was an interface between heaven and earth. Heaven was superimposed on this garden. Up until Lucifer said, I will ascend. I will rise up and I will enthrone myself to be above God. Now, Here's the principle that I want you to learn. 
God hates rebellion with passion. God hates rebellion. No one can equate himself with God and get out with it. So whenever there is rebellion, God will release his wrath. Because in the book of Isaiah 42, the Bible says in verse 8, God has no competitor. He will not share his glory with anyone. Praise the name of Jesus. When Lucifer says, I will exalt myself, I will ascend to the heavens, when he equated himself with God, he violated a very fundamental principle. You never, you never, you never equate yourself with God. That will, nothing will invite God's judgment faster than that. Praise the name of Jesus. That was the devastation that happened. And that is the history of God's wrath. And then let's fast forward. All of a sudden, we find God in verse 2 now remodeling things. He is now restoring things. I love the idea of the Holy Spirit hovering over broken pieces. Hallelujah. Don't you just love that? And let me just minister to somebody who has broken pieces. It doesn't matter how much devastation you have faced, how much devastation you have experienced, but there is the Spirit of the living God who will hover over broken pieces. And notice that the Holy Spirit is now watching over God's raw material. Hallelujah. He's now watching over God's raw material so that the enemy will not even have access to God's raw material. Uh, until the word is declared, let there be light. Amen. The Holy Spirit will ensure that he overs over those broken pieces up until a word of restoration is uttered by God. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Because you see, when God creates and he says it's beautiful, it is good, his word will never go back to him void. When God created the heavens and the earth, all that was beautiful to him. When Lucifer messed things up, God was not about to change his mind. So verse 2 had to happen where God is now reconfiguring things and restructuring things. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He is faithful. He's not a man that he should lie. No, a son of man that he should change his mind. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, we see another conflict happen. Later on he comes to the garden, the garden of Eden now. And Adam and Eve are there. He begins to question God's instruction. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve yielded to his suggestion that, listen, you can partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because God knows that when you partake of it, you will be like him. Notice the same, the same type of thinking, to be like God. To be like God. God knows that when you partake of this fruit of knowledge of good and evil, you will be like him. So he's now pushing this agenda to humanity now. In other words, he is recruiting an army for himself. He does not want to be rebellious against God alone. He wants humanity, humanity now to say, listen, we want to be like God. We want to be like God ourselves. Now, this is unfortunately a catastrophic situation because here you find God coming and cursing the ground because of that. There is another devastation. I wonder if you ever thought about this. Are you aware that in the original creation there were no thorns? There were no thorns. There were no thistles. But because of the curse that had been pronounced, all of a sudden thorns are sprouting out. Thistles are sprouting out. So at this time, even nature was subjected to corruption because of man's sin. That is the release of God's wrath. And that is why, actually, when you fast forward, go to Romans chapter 8, from verse 8, the Bible says, all creation is waiting in eager expectation for the true sons of God to manifest. Why? Because creation was subjected to decay, not by its own choice, but by the one who subjected it. Let me, let me remind you, nature is groaning for its restoration. Why? Why is nature groaning for its restoration? Because nature is not supposed to be managed by ungodly people. I want you to appreciate that when God created the heavens and the earth, God put his nature in them. So that nature cannot respond appropriately to ungodly people. So that is why, beloved, Creation is waiting for the true sons of God to manifest. Creation is crying out for its own restoration. Whatever beauty
everything you see around the earth, you have not seen anything compared to what God had intended in the original plan. Now, for this nature to be restored, you have to be restored first. You are the name of Jesus. You have to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, all creation is being delayed by us if we don't connect with God. That is why creation is waiting for true sons of God. So that once they are saved, nature can also be saved. Amen. Sure. I want you to therefore appreciate this. These rumblings that you see, even in the book of Revelation, when you see earthquakes, when you see the seas turning into blood, when you see the skies rolling up, when you see stars falling from the sky, it is nature, it is nature crying for its redemption. It is, it is, it is God's judgment and also nature groaning, saying, please, Lord, restore us, restore us, restore us back to the original plan. But in the midst of all this, God is faithful, beloved. Are you aware that in the midst of judgment, God shows his mercy? In the midst of, 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 of judgment, notice this. In the midst of all these things that are happening, God decided to slaughter an animal for Adam and Eve. As a matter of fact, that's why you will meet Adam and Eve in heaven. Hallelujah. You will meet because they were restored. Hallelujah. They were restored immediately when they fell into sin. And that is why this is this is the strategy that the enemy has. He always looks for people he can collaborate with. But we bless the Lord that Adam and Eve came to their senses and when they realized that they had sinned, they went back to God. And actually, there are some Jewish texts that will actually tell you that they started even teaching uh, their sons, Enoch, and they started teaching Noah. They started teaching all of them the ways of the Lord and how they had drifted away from God so that men would not repeat the same mistake. Sure. Now, here's the thing. When the enemy cannot find when the enemy cannot find people that he can collaborate with, he will do the unthinkable. And this will take us to Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, he does the unthinkable. Fallen angels audaciously went to the daughters of men and they slept with them. And the Bible tells us that the offspring that was born, the Nephilim, the giants of those days, and these, actually, when you, when you read again some of the Hebrew texts, you, you, you realize that th this was a very ungodly situation. First of all, angels were not supposed to procreate with men. But they did the unthinkable. And during this time, when the enemy had realized that Adam and Eve are no longer cooperating, and during this time, he realized Noah is preaching righteousness. So, obviously, there is a remnant here. He cannot take over because originally he was, he was in charge. He was in charge in the original plan. But now there is no preaching righteousness. And then he realizes, listen, for me to fully take over, because this is the thinking in devil's mind. In, in Lucifer's mind, this is the thinking. I need to overcome on the earth before I ascend to overthrow God. That's the thinking. In other words, I cannot overthrow God as long as on the earth there are people that are governing on behalf of heaven. So for, for, for me to go and ascend to where God is, I must rule and reign here. But Noah is disturbing my blood. And then he decides, and then he decides, let me release my 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 angels to sleep with the daughters of men and and all the, the offspring there uh, were very ungodly ungodly people horrible people i was reading the book of jesha uh, the reason why I'm, I'm referring to it is because the book of chronicles does refer to it. It, it the story is horrific these men were ungodly the offspring they even they, they, their appetites were so much that the earth could not sustain them they were eating everything, everything, to a point that when there was not enough vegetation, not enough animals to feed them, they started eating humans. And then when the Bible says, Noah was spared, literally the population was being reduced to a point that there, there were just very few human beings left. And even those that were left, 
they were genetically con contaminated. They did not have the original genetic material that God had put into humanity. Sure. And this is a sin that you need to understand. It, it, is, it, is, it is an abomination before God to crossbreed. Yeah. Listen, Leviticus 19.19, God says, don't crossbreed any living thing. There must be no miscegenation. There must be no mingling of genetic material. Humans must only crossbreed with humans. You cannot have animals and humans. You cannot have this mixing of things happening. And, and this is what these angels started dabbling into. And when God looked upon the earth, it was unrecognizable. And that is why, as Bob Kangina read yesterday, actually, when the Bible says only Noah was found to be pure, that has two dimensions. Noah was pure spiritually, but Noah was also pure in his genetic makeup. Because there was so much corruption that you, you, you could be walking with a human being who was half human because of what the fallen angels had done. And, and then I want you to again appreciate this is what the enemy is doing here. He's now trying to create a parallel race that will compete with the human race. Because Noah is preaching righteousness here. And then he realized he's not winning as long as there is a preacher. Praise the name of Jesus. Please say it with me, I'm a remnant. So as long as there is a remnant, he realizes he cannot take over. Can I just encourage you? You will be amazed how powerful your presence here on earth is. If you are not around, the devil will be wreaking havoc here on this planet. But because of your presence, because of your intercession, because you are a prayer warrior, because you are pushing against the gates of hate, Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hate will not prevail against it. Because of what you are doing when you are praying day in and day out, when you go down on your knees interceding, praying against the works of the evil one, you are doing a lot of damage. Sure. It's just that some of you just don't see it. Thank you, let say, don't stop praying. So when he realizes that the only thing that I can do is to create a parallel race so that this race will outcompete, outdo, and totally get rid of God's human race. And this was about to happen. Listen, beloved, there was going to be no human being left if God had not taken Noah into the ark. That's how bad the situation is. So when you see the flooding happening, you see the release of God's breath happening, please don't blame God. That's the point I'm trying to get to. I want you to understand the wrath of God in context. When he made his creation, he said it is beautiful, it is cool, it is pleasurable. And then there comes Lucifer contaminating the whole of human race. When you actually read, Genesis chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, you realize he did not only contaminate human beings, even animals were contaminated. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Started mixing things up. Started mixing things up. Yeah. So that it was going to be very different from what God had planned originally. And then that was an act of treason in the realm of the spirit. Sure. And it is for this reason that God decided to flood the earth. But notice that God is merciful. That ark represents God's mercy in the midst of judgment. Hallelujah. You see, God does not give up on us even when we mess up. And then even God has, the, has this kindness and this mercy to even show us a rainbow after the flowers. To say, you know what, my children, I love you so much. I don't want to do this again. Never again will I destroy the earth by flooding. Hallelujah. Why? Because although he is a God who loves justice, but he is loving. Praise the name of Jesus. Sure. Here's the thing, beloved. You need to appreciate that the coming wrath is a draw to a close. The coming wrath. You have seen the pre-Adamic wrath. You have seen the wrath in the Garden of Eden. We have seen the wrath even during the time of Noah. The coming breath will be unprecedented. No. The Bible tells us there's something that is not going to be comparable with anything that has happened on the face of the earth. 
Because the devil is going to take his game to a higher level. But can you said this yesterday, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be at the coming of the Son of Man. And I want you to understand that there is evil like you won't believe even in our day. Man is still rebellious against God. Man is doing the unthinkable things. I don't know if you are aware that there is even technology for gene editing, even as we speak. Are you aware that they are just waiting for the government to give them the go ahead so that they can manipulate your genes and mix it with something else? It's already happening. They are just waiting for government. It, they, they, are still, they are still debating about the ethics of this whole thing. But the technology is already there to alter human DNA. Actually, it's, it's, it's happening already in some places. That in China, there is a baby that was born who is naturally immune to HIV. So here, the, the, this is what they did. They manipulated her DNA so that her immunity will be naturally, naturally able to fight off the virus, HIV virus. And then she, she is totally immune because of genetic manipulation. And here's the thing, this is something very good medically speaking. There is something that is very beneficial medically speaking, but here's the problem. You take the same technology and you put it in the hands of the enemy. Chaos will break loose. Chaos will, I, I'm sure, have you, have you heard of a, a, a something called Viagra? Libra or Liagra, the combination of a lion and a tiger. A huge animal that is adorable. Everyone is saying how cute, how cute. And these are things they are doing already, beloved. And it's a matter of time again. These days, it's not fallen angels sleeping with the daughters of men. It's happening in a contextual picture. It's happening in a, something that is culturally relevant through science. Genetic modification so that you come up with a strange human being. And let me just say this to you. Once the enemy start engineering human beings, those human beings can never, they can never receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It is impossible. There will be a parallel race who will always oppose the plans of the Most High God. And that is why it's amazing that Jesus alludes to these things when, when you read scriptures. Uh, that there are scriptures that you come across when, when Jesus is asked by uh, 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 Nicodemus, How, what can I do to be born again? Yeah. And Jesus goes into a place which is very interesting. He says, unless you are born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. To be sure, that word water, to be born of water there, does not necessarily refer to water baptism. Mm -hmm. To be born of water simply means to be humanly born. Yeah. Sure. To be born the natural way. In other words, to be born as a human being. And you cannot, you cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven unless you are human. So, for you to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to be human first. And then the second thing is, you have to be born of the spirit of the living God. And once you are born of the spirit of the living God, then you can enter the kingdom of heaven. And why is Jesus saying all these strange things, beloved? It's because he knows that in the last days, in the last days, as it was in the days of Noah, there's going to come a time when we will live with a parallel race. And then there are scriptures, and even Daniel chapter 2 verse 43, it's very interesting, there's a modern English version of Daniel chapter 2 verse 3, when it speaks about the end time kingdom. The end time kingdom that will be established in the last days, he says, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. This is the end time kingdom that, uh, that Daniel is referring to in verse 43. The modern English version puts it in a very clearer way. It says they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. So we are living in times where they are pseudo-human beings. But in the midst of all that, it doesn't matter what the enemy tries. Here's the word of encouragement, of encouragement to you. The gates of hate will not reveal against the church. The gates of hate will not reveal against us, beloved. I want you to be encouraged. No matter how many ploys on the enemy are, no matter what the enemy tries, but the church will remain triumphant. Tomorrow we're going to talk about 
the wrath that will happen in these last days. And the message that I want to say to you is, you were not meant to be part of that wrath. Praise the name of Jesus. Listen, you are not supposed to be here when all these things happen. Praise the name of Jesus. Just like God provided a place of escape for, 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 for Lord and his family, he shall provide a place of escape for us. They come, the reason why, the reason why we should not even be around is this, beloved. You see, unlike in the Garden of Eden, when he tried to tempt Eve and Adam, they came to their senses and they started repenting. So they realigned themselves with God. Sure. During the time of Noah, when there was flooding, Noah remained an intercessor. So, for the very first time in history, as we approach the time of tribulation, there will be no intercessors. Sure. That's what's going to be unique about the coming tribulation. There will be no intercessors. Sure. In other words, the period of grace will have come to an end. Yeah. During the time of tribulation, sure. during the time of tribulation, the church will have been taken to heaven. Yeah. The, the, the Bible says in the book of Second of, of Second Thessalonians, the Bible says this. It says Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses seven and, two, uh, seven and eight. It says, "He who hinders will continue to hinder." Up until he's taken out of the way, the Antichrist will not be revealed. In other words, he will not manifest. He will, that word manifest simply means he will not do as he pleases. He will not come to the center stage. Why? Because there is a praying church, praying church, praying church. There is a church that is pushing back against the kingdom of darkness. For you to understand this, you need to understand the conversation between Abraham and God. In chapter 18 of Genesis, Abraham is looking at the wickedness of Sodom. He says, Lord, what if there are 50 people here? Yeah. Sure. Will you still pass your judgment upon the city? Sure. Will you still destroy? And this is what God says, no, for the sake of the 50 righteous people, I will not destroy the city. Abraham goes down. What about 45? What if there are just 45 people in the city? Will you destroy it? And then God says, no, for the sake of... The number goes down to 10. Sure. Even if there are 10 people in the city, I will not destroy the city. And then Abraham says, God does not punish the wicked together with the righteous. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, here's the thing, beloved. We are interceding. We are standing in the way. And I want you to appreciate this. As long as you are here, the judgment of God will not fall upon this earth. You have to be removed just like Lot was removed for God to release his wrath upon this earth. Praise the name of Jesus. Actually, if, if gay people, if the LGBTI community understood the role you are playing, they will not mess with the church. The reason why they can practice homosexuality with freedom is because we are praying. They are covered by our prayers. Every time God looks at this immorality, he wants to release his role, but you step in. You stand as a gap standing. You stand as a man, a watchman on the wall. You say, Lord, don't destroy. Don't destroy. Don't destroy. Men are raping even newborn babies. Men are raping grandmothers. And these are things that are happening in our nation. People are being killed for their cell phones. These are things that are happening in our nation. But there is an intercessor that says, Lord, give them a second chance. Give them a second chance of God. Just, just don't destroy. Not yet, Lord. Not yet. Maybe they will get saved. Maybe they will get saved. Give them a chance. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I want you to understand that immorality is going to be so much on the rise. God will have no choice but to remove you so that he can deal with the immorality on this planet. Sure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to appreciate that God is merciful. Even in the midst of judgment that will come, God will still be merciful in the sense that he will send two witnesses in the midst of judgment, he will send two witnesses who will preach the gospel. Praise the name of Jesus. But notice that they will no longer be interceding. They will no longer be crying out for government. For now, in this dispensation of grace, we still pray for corrupt politicians. Yes? We still plead mercy for corrupt leaders. 
It is a dispensation of grace. We come before God and say, Lord, give them a chance. Give them a chance. Yes, we know there is no service delivery. We know they are, they, are, they, they are abusing funds, but Lord, give them a chance. We pray for them. There is going to come a time when there is an antichrist government and there will be no intercessor to intercede for it. Sure. It will be a perilous time, beloved. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, we find even in heaven that there is no mercy. We find the souls of the righteous under the altar. They are crying to God, Lord, when will you avenge our blood? No intercession statements. When will you avenge our blood? When will you avenge our blood? So I want you to understand, if even mercy no longer exists for that government in heaven, darkness will close it. We about tell the guy? The world is yet to discover the amount of light there is on this planet because of you. Sure. And when you are taken away, the world is going to be a dark, dark place. It is for this reason that I beseech you by the mercies of the Lord. Walk in holiness. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Walk in holiness. Because whatever wrath is coming upon this earth is not intended for you. Praise the name of Jesus. Just stand on our feet. I, I want to encourage you, beloved. If ever there was a time for us to walk in a manner that pleases God, this is now the time. If ever there was a time for us to reach out to souls with the gospel of Jesus Christ and do so urgently, now is the time. To be more accurate, even the preaching of the gospel, when the word of God says, the end will not come up until this word of the kingdom has reached the ends of the earth. That refers to even the time of tribulation. God is so faithful. God is so gracious that he will not only just send the two witnesses during the time of tribulation. He will even send 144,000 preachers. Sure. 144,000 Jewish preachers will be preaching the gospel. During those days, even the angel will be proclaiming the message of repentance. That's how gracious God is. But notice that they will not be interceding for the Antichrist government. They will be speaking judgment. And they will be speaking the word of salvation to those who want to avail themselves to Christ. But my prayer is this. May you not be here when those things happen. Praise the name of Jesus. May you not be found on this planet when that happens. And in America, there is a, a huge organization of believers. They call themselves preppers. They are building underground bunkers, trying to get ready for the end times. Some are stocking food. There are huge warehouses built by believers because they are preparing for the time of tribulation. Here's the thing. There is no way you can hide from the Antichrist in a bunker somewhere. You will not be able to hide. They will track you down. There is no amount of food stock that you can actually stock up in order to prepare for that time. But here is an easier solution. Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord. Just receive Jesus as your Lord. Receive him. And then walk in holiness. That is the best preparation. Because during that time, there is no amount of food that will save you. There is no bunker. Sure. God, the Bible tells us that even those kings that will be hiding in caves, God will even shake the caves. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Even the elite of the time will say, please bury us. They will be crying in their bunkers. They will be crying, please bury us and hide us from the wrath of the one who is coming. Sure. That's not the portion. <laughs> but Kalina spoke about the mansions that are prepared for us. That is your destiny. That is your place. Praise the name of Jesus. To be sure, the time of tribulation, the Bible refers to is as the time of Jacob's trouble. During that time, God will be demanding the attention of Israel because they have denied him as the Messiah. But the gentle nations, that's you and I, we have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Don't hang around. Please turn to them and say, don't hang around here. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's lift up our hands. Let's lift up our hands. Father in Jesus' name, Baba we give you praise. We give you honor and glory. Thank you that you have made a provision for us. Thank you in the name of Jesus that in the midst of what is coming, 
you have prepared, you have prepared a place for us in Jesus' name. And I pray to your Father God, between now and then, help us to preach the gospel. Between now and then, help us to make disciples. Between now and then, help us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. In the name of Jesus, you are God who is merciful. You are God who is gracious. You are God who will not punish the wicked together with the Russians. In Jesus' name. And I pray for a way of escape. When the trumpet shall sound, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that those that are called by your name be taken out to glory. In Jesus' name. Lord, we praise that we honor. I want to hear a sound of the church that is getting ready for the Messiah. Can I hear say glory? Say, I'm going to 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 say